Jeff, uh, you're good now, so uh, can you just start it again uh, from the beginning? I, I will do that. Thank you, Jay. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Jay. We're happy to be a part of Midas' ongoing webinar series, and I'll talk a little bit about how we use this program. Uh, what we're going to cover today, uh, I'll briefly I'll talk about our motivation for using the MIDAS program on this project. Second, I'll give you a quick overview of the project itself and, and the particular bridge. And then we'll dive into the heart of the talk, which focuses on development of the MIDAS model and some of the results we got. And then finally, we'll go over that results and discuss how they compare to some other uh, programs, commercial programs. We opted to develop a MIDAS model for several reasons. Uh, first of all, this is a complex bridge, and we really wanted to increase our level of confidence in both the analysis and design. We wanted to make sure we were capturing everything that went on and didn't miss any crucial elements. Uh, second, it gives us a tool that can address more than just superstructure design. So we can go beyond just designing the steel girders and the cross frames. Uh, things we can look at include construction sequencing, and not just a deck pour, but actual erection of the steel girders themselves. We can look at thermal deformation and figure out what displacement demands are being passed on to each bearing or support. We can also look at seismic demands and figure out how the seismic force is distributed to the various substructure units. Another reason to look at this was the uh, shortcomings of traditional steel design software. Uh, for example, uh, people who have used MDX might, might realize that sometimes you get pretty high demands in your cross frames. Uh, we know why MDX is generating those, but we're not really sure that uh, they're, they're truly realistic of what's going on. And then finally, it gave us an example to learn and evaluate the MIDAS program itself. Well, this bridge is part of a very large design build project. It's called the Ohio River Bridges. Uh, it involves crossings over the Ohio River between Indiana and Kentucky. Uh, those are the two owners of the project. It actually consists of two separate projects. We have the East End Crossing, which the Indiana Department of Transportation has taken the lead on. And we have the Downtown Crossing, which the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet has taken the lead on. The Downtown Crossing contains the bridge we'll be talking about today. It has a approximately $860 million project value, that is both design and construction. It was split into three sections, one, two, and three. And you can see the aerial over on the left there has the the uh, blue, yellow, and red color coding the sections. The junctions of Interstate 64, 65, and 71 come together in downtown Louisville, and that's locally known as the Kennedy Interchange, uh, or also sometimes referred to as the Spaghetti Junction. Section 1 rebuilds this interchange in its current place, and uh, the concept plans call for 41 permanent bridges, and the rendering on the right there uh, shows a the uh, the image of what the rebuilt interchange should look like. It involves both a mix of eye girders and tubs using both steel and concrete. Bridge AO37 is one of the 41 bridges in Section 1 of the Downtown Crossing Project. It's approximately 952 feet long and 34 feet wide. It consists of two units. Unit 1 has pre-stressed concrete girders. It's about 340 feet long and is divided into three spans. Unit 2 is constructed with steel eye girders. It's approximately 611 feet long and consists of five spans. Multi-column pier bents are used for all the substructures, and they're constructed with reinforced concrete. Now, this slide shows the general layout sheet, and, and I realize you cannot read the text that's on there, but I wanted to try to capture an overview of this, this whole bridge. Those orange circles there show the Unit 2. Uh, which is what we modeled and analyzed in MIDAS. Uh, zooming in, it gives you a little, bit, a little better idea of this bridge. Again, about uh, 600 feet long, uh, steel plate girders, five spans. Uh, the cross section on the bottom there, again, showing you the, the three girders, about 34 feet out to out. Now, MDX was used for the design of this bridge, and there are a couple reasons. Uh, first of all, the pursuit work for this job was done within MDX, so we had a real good starting point. Two, the project had an approved software list. MIDAS was not on that initial list, and we did not request its inclusion because we simply didn't own MIDAS at the start of this job. 
And finally, Midas did not have steel capabilities when we started this project. That's something that's been added within the last month, and our plans were due earlier this year. Design started on this bridge in August of 2013. We had an estimated completion date, and that was final RFC, uh, around uh, April of this year. And that actually kind of pushed into May due to changes and pauses. Uh, the majority of those were, were contractor requested as we started to look at different scenarios and different ways of, of building things. Well, as you saw in that general layout sheet, the bridge has some complex geometry. Uh, we have curved girder segments, even some straight segments. Uh, the substructures have varying skews, and then the framing plan uh, ended up being somewhat complex as well. You can see here on the screen, we also have nine discrete pour regions for the concrete deck. And so considering all this, we used AutoCAD to develop the girder geometry. We also were able to go in and figure out how we wanted to discretize those girders along the line and also create dummy deck elements, which is something I'll talk about uh, in a little bit. We were able to save a DXF and then import this into MIDAS. All other geometry for the model was developed within MIDAS itself. At this time, I'm going to leave the PowerPoint and we're going to go into MIDAS and we'll walk through a bunch of uh, what we did for the model development. So, uh, so here we are in MIDAS. For those that are familiar with it or maybe haven't seen it, this is the interface. Uh, you're seeing the entire bridge model here. And I have the uh, extruded view turned on so you can see the element cross sections. And I'm going to go ahead and zoom in a minute so you can uh, see some of this a little better. Well, the first thing I want to talk about was section properties. Uh, this refers to your elements such as frames and plates. In the tree menu over here to the left, you can see we have properties section. And if I expand that, that brings up all the prop section properties we have defined within this model. We used Midas's composite section property to model the girder plus the tributary deck area. I can go ahead and select this first group so you can see. Here you go, these little uh, the red line indicates the elements that have the property composite one hyphen A assigned to them. That nomenclature is this composite section for girder one, part A, A, B, C, D. Those are just increments we had to keep track of the various uh, plate sections along the girder. The composite sections themselves are defined with this, within this data sheet. And you can see, again, we've got a, a tributary slab width up top, uh, the steel girder down here, and all the necessary geometry defined over here. And as, also, as well, you get material properties. So pretty uh, uh, robust uh, data entry form that allows us to get all those properties in relatively quickly. We ended up with a total of 40 unique composite section properties. Uh, the number was so high because of variations in, in plate sizes, you know, again, different uh, flange thicknesses and widths, uh, different tributary deck widths for the interior and exterior girders, and also being able to accommodate the deck port in sequence. Well, I would mentioned dummy deck elements earlier, uh, and what those refer to is we need a way to, dis to connect these discrete girder lines that we've modeled with the composite section properties. Really, we want to mimic the diaphragm action of the deck itself. And that was done with beam elements that connect these girder lines. Well, I scroll down a little bit, you can see all these little W sections. Again, here we have W61 was a bunch of these dummy deck elements connecting the girders. You can see it's got a, an eight and a half inch thickness, which is the stru structural thickness of the deck, and a tributary width of 61 inches. Those widths varied along the bridge depending on how we had discretized the girder. In the end, we had to have 32 different elements defined to accommodate all the required widths. We also used a weightless material for these dummy elements. Again, all we're after is the stiffness of the diaphragm action. The weight of the deck is already accounted for elsewhere within the program. Uh, the steel cross frames were defined with uh, your typical AISC steel members. You can see over here we've got a, an angle iron, for example, uh, you know, 6 by 6 by 9 sixteenths. Uh, that defined a lot of the top cords and diagonals. A couple other uh, angle sections here that 
were used along the bridge. Able to pull that in directly from a database. So again, AISC database, drop down list to choose a section you want. So pretty convenient. And then finally, we used various solid cross sections to model the peer cap and the peer column. We defined three materials with this in the model. We had a grade 50 steel that was used for all the uh, girders, cross frame, structural steel elements. We had a 4,000 PSI concrete. And then we had a weightless concrete for those dummy deck elements. The weightless concrete was also a, a, a 4,000 PSI strength. We ended up using that weightless concrete for all the uh, substructure units as well. And the reason being is that we wanted to be able to get total vertical reactions and compare that to hand calcs for just a superstructure. It's important to note that MIDAS does support time-dependent material properties, uh, but we do not consider the, those in, the, in our analysis. Uh, obviously, it could be something you may want to consider depending upon your project. Uh, next, I wanted to talk about local nodal axes. For a curved bridge, it's often easier to work in the radial and tangential directions. This is especially true if you think about the bearings at all your substructure units. To help with that, we defined local axes, which corresponded to the radial and tangential directions at each pier on the curve. First, I'm going to turn off this extruded view. And now I can turn on these local axes. So again, you can see at this pier we have uh, a tangential the, the x-axis is tangential, the y-axis is radial, and that just facilitates uh, input for various things. You might also notice that we have some local axes at, the, at these cross frames. And those, uh, those are allowed us to uh, define restraints that are ultimately required for, for computational stability. Uh, and what I'm referring to here is that the cross frames themselves were modeled as truss elements, so they only have an axial force. Therefore, we needed to provide some out-of-plane restraint at that knee. And local axis, axes really facilitated the definition of such restraints. That gives us a good segue to the next part of this talk, and that's the boundary conditions. We, had a variety, we used a mix of support conditions on this, on this model. First, I'm going to zoom back out to the entire view. Uh, rigid supports. Well, we used rigid supports to enforce full fixity at the bottom of the pier columns. We also used them to prevent transverse and vertical translation at abutment number two, that being the far abutment out here. We can turn this uh, symbology on in MIDAS. And you can see this kind of a hexagonal shape. It's got six little wedges in it. And if the wedge is green, it means that degree of freedom is restrained. And so we have all six restrained here. Again, full fixity. Uh, down here at that far abutment, if you start at about 1 o'clock, that is the, the x direction, y, z, and then your rotations. So you can see we have two of the six uh, restrained. We also use spring supports. Uh, we have linear springs to prevent the outer plane motion at the knee of the cross frames. That's something I had just mentioned a few minutes ago. We chose springs because they can limit the motion without drawing a large amount of force uh, to that joint that a rigid support might tend to do. We also had springs to mimic the longitudinal bearing, uh, longitudinal resistance of the bearing at abutment two. And just like these uh, rigid supports, we can turn on symbology for the spring supports as well. And it uses a similar type approach. Again, you've got that hexagonal shape with the six wedges. This time yellow indicates uh, the an active spring. Uh, blue indicates a spring is not applied in that direction. Uh, finally, we used elastic links to help connect model portions at their proper locations. We used rigid elastic links to connect the cross frame 
cross frame nodes at the girders. And I can turn those on as well. And I'll zoom in so we can see. Uh, those composite section elements for, for the girder you know, only have a single node. They're like a frame element. So we needed a second node down here to truly model these cross frames. And that's where we use that rigid elastic constraint to make these pairs of nodes behave like rigid bodies. We also used elastic links at the bearings, at some of the pier bearings. And again, that allows us to connect the bottom of our girder support to the center line of the pier cap. And again, that's what you're seeing here, elastic links. These were not completely rigid. These were elastic, and we could define stiffnesses that corresponded to the uh, uh, stiffness of the elastomeric bearings. We experimented with multiple models that varied uh, the values and or combinations of these boundary conditions and encourage uh, anybody who does any kind of FE modeling to do the same. Uh, your models can be uh, sensitive to, to these values, and you want to make sure that uh, you're forcing the model to behave like the real structure is. Well, I was going to talk next about construction staging. And recall that one of our motivations for using MIDAS was the ability to replicate construction sequencing. And yes, MDX and other programs will handle deck pour sequences, but MIDAS ultimately gives us a resource where we could evaluate girder erection too. That question hasn't been asked, but we suspect it may be coming from the contractor once they get a little farther into construction of this bridge. We had a total of uh, 12 construction stages. The first one being steel erection. Second, we put up deck formwork. Then we had nine deck placements, if you recall that AutoCAD drawing I showed earlier. And then we had a final step, which was curing, just allowing the entire deck to, to harden. Now let me zoom back out so we can see the whole bridge. And I'm going to turn that extruded view back on. And now if I select just the girder erection stage, You can see all the deck elements go away, and we're seeing just the steel girders. That's all we have activated at that stage, as well as the substructure elements. And if I jump ahead and select uh, deck placement one, uh, no visible change. And, and that makes sense, because all we have really done is that is added the load of the wet deck from pore one. If I move forward to pore two, you can see we now have elements activated. These are the elements that were placed in deck pore one. They have now hardened and, and act with the structure. And then we would have the loads for deck.